Hello everyone and welcome back to our next session. It's going to be a discussion on the topic who governs the Wikimedia movement and why you should care. We have Nikki Tsoyna, Eva Martin and uh, Nico Ever to speak on this topic. Nikki, the floor is yours. Thank you, Carol. Thanks everybody for joining us. Um, I also want to give a thanks to Asaf who introduced the topic of um, movement strategy yesterday and made an excellent case for why you should care. So I'm gonna to try to further convince you why you should care about this particular part of movement strategy. Um, I also wanna reintroduce my two colleagues um, and myself. So my name is Nikki Zeiner. We also have with us Eva Martin and Nicole Eba, and the three of us uh, constitute the Movement Strategy and Global Relations Team, Movement Strategy and Global Relations Team at Wikimedia Germany. And um, so we're excited to talk to you about this part of movement strategy, which is the governance um, that ha it has been occupying us quite a bit over the last year and also will presumably over the next year. Next slide. Um, so Asaf talked about the movement, no, actually one, one before. Um, Okay, and also, Ifa, I think you're in a different, <laughs> this is good. Ifa's in a different um, presentation than what I'm actually presenting. So I'm gonna share the presentation more quickly. Okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> and just a second here. I'm gonna do it in the Google chat, Ifa. Um, So um, Asaf talked uh, yesterday about um, movement strategy and uh, mentioned a number of opportunities and how um, especially people in CE could uh, participate. And one other one. Okay. Um, one of the ones is around the governance of the multimedia movement, which will be basically tossed up in the air and redesigned this year. And uh, where you can find the background for that is the movement strategy recommendation number four. Um, next slide, please. Um, which is entitled, Ensure Equity in Decision-Making. And I think Asaf mentioned the Global Council and the Charter yesterday. So that's the recommendation that says that we will establish a Global Council that represents the movement in its role and composition. And um, that is basically the democratic participatory decision-making um, body, a new body that we don't have right now that will be created. Uh, next slide. Um, the other thing that um, is mentioned in um, in recommendation number four is regional thematic hubs. That's also a buzzword that you've heard a lot already and that I think CE uh, as a group or some people in that group um, are already actively working on um, a, a, a hub for Eastern Europe. Um, and I mentioned these together because I, I feel like the global body and uh, regional hubs sort of complement each other. We have a principle in the in the um, movement strategy uh, recommendations that is the principle of self-management and subsidiarity. And what that means is that the decisions should be made as close to the people that are affected by the decisions as possible. So um, the regional and thematic hubs are a way for local and regional communities to, to work together and make decisions on their own behalf. Whereas the global council um, is the entity that makes the decisions for the entire movement that affect everybody in the movement and need participation for everyone. Next slide. Um, there's an interesting sentence, sort of a disclaimer in this recommendation for that talks about the relationship between that soon to be established global council and the uh, Wikimedia Foundation Board of Trustees. And it basically says the Board of Trustees right now has a legal and fiduciary responsibility for movement money, for movement oversight, for all the things that um, hopefully later the Global Council um, will take over. 
And so there needs to be a process for transferring that mandate from the Wikimedia Foundation Board of Trustees to the Global Council. Um, and then also there's uh, an interesting sentence that says, the Global Council may later develop further capacities and take on more responsibilities over time. And I'm going to open up a little bit of window to that future of what those further capacities and responsibilities might be. Um, next slide, please. So um, a lot of you probably have sort of listened with one ear or were even participating in the process discussions that we've occupied ourselves with over the last year. And uh, as Asaf mentioned yesterday, we now have a drafting group um, for, the, for the charter. And so we can just move on and not talk. We can now, we can still, we still have to talk about process because we have to talk about how are people going to be involved in the whole drafting experience and what types of evidence are we gonna have for input? What does ratification look like? All that will still happen. But at least speaking for our team, we are eager to actually talk about the main questions. Next slide. Um, which haven't really been addressed um, yet. Um, and, and those are what is in that charter and how is it going to change our movement um, after everybody signs off on that charter. So some of these questions are who governs what? Which body, like we talked about the board of trustees, we talked about um, the new global council. We also know that we have affiliates, we're going to have clubs, which bodies uh, has which powers, who makes decisions about what? Um, also, are all the powers of the Global Council really just the ones that the Wikimedia Foundation Board of Trustees hands over to them? And how does that transfer of power happen? That might not be in the charter, that might be in some kind of agreement, but it's definitely something we'll need to talk about. Um, and I mentioned the further capacities. So what further capacities would make sense? What um, capacities should the Global Council build? And and then more broadly, how do we create this big decentralized movement that we had envisioned, but at the same time, make sure that those core functions that the Wikimedia Foundation now does and does very well, like trademarks, platforms, software development, endowment, fundraising, all those things, how do we make sure those don't get um, at risk? And then of course, what is the role of hubs? Hubs, hubs, hubs is always a big question. We're gonna talk a lot more about hubs, not in this session, but in, a bunch of different meetings that are coming up. So next slide, please, Bifa. Why do we care? So Asal <laughs> yesterday made, already made a pretty good case of why this is all exciting. And um, he, he uh, said there's gonna be new money. So if you wanna do stuff that has to do with movement strategy, um, you can now apply for grants and they're not insignificant amounts of money. Um, we can innovate and experiment. And he also said, we can influence global strategy. And I think I wanna take that another step further um, because not only do we influence global strategy, but in turn we influence the way we, we are going to work as stakeholders and not just this year, but for decades to come. The charter is gonna be a big um, groundbreaking document and what's in there is gonna affect how you do your work, how money flows, who you work with, opportunities you have, all kinds of stuff. It will set up how decisions are made about tech, the technology, the platforms, about money, policy. Um, so right now I would wager that we have a unique window of opportunity to, to improve our movement and to really bring it into the present um, because our governance structures are much older and much more colonialistic, let's say, than many, many others, um, many other international movements are. And we can actually bring it into the, not just the present, but into the future and set ourselves up to be relevant, sustainable, open, equitable, you name it. So I, I left like a open uh, bullet there. Enter your reason, enter, enter your vision for the movement that, um, for the movement that you would like to see. And now is the time to write that in the charter. So that's why you should care. Um, next slide. 
Okay, so here's like a little picture. We're still like a little bit grappling with our graphics, so don't pay too much attention to them. But right now we have this organically grown structure, which has the Wikimedia Foundation and its board of trustees as its governing body in the center. And then there's all kinds of relationships to uh, the other stakeholders in the movement. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> Thanks, Ab. Um, so 2030, our strategy, some, we envision something like that, um, that is more holistic, um, that has the affiliates and the WMF and the hubs and everybody, the communities, everybody jointly, um, creating this movement and, and, and filling this movement with life. Um, and, and the Global Council as the entity that is sort of uh, the highest uh, governing body. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> I just want to say, I kind of said this earlier, but hubs I, I, are definitely going to have a big importance, again, because the subsidiarity principle will uh, be, be uh, furthered by the you know, the existence of regional hubs. And there will definitely be um, language in the charter on hubs. So if you're like passionate about what a hub's gonna be, help write this charter. Um, the hubs also, I'm pretty sure, will have seats in the global body along with other affiliates and other individuals, entities we don't know yet. Um, and they will have important decision-making uh, uh, powers. However, they complement. So they're there, but they complement in our vision the global governance model that makes the movement decisions. Um, so um, let's move on to the next slide. Is the is the comment from Anas something that I need to address right now? Ifa, uh, Ifa can't see the chat as she's oh. sharing the slides. And Anas's I question, I would, I would park uh, the question for a couple okay. of minutes because we get closer to. Uh, to that topic in a okay, couple of minutes. Thanks, Anas, for your comment. We won't forget it. Exactly. Um, Thanks, Nicole. And once I, we are done with sharing the presentation, I can take over the chat moderation again. Mm -hmm. um, but keep, keep adding comments, keep adding your thoughts, and we'll, we'll go through them. I'll try to get through this so we have some time. Um, so we've thought about what this global governance structure is. So, okay, we're parking hubs, and we're looking at the global thing. Um, the global governance structures, the global council, as we call it now, as it's called in the recommendation. Um, we can, when we think about this, it could really go two ways. Um, one is, or it could arrive, let's say, at two, two destinations. <laughs> one is we're adding a global advisory board or body to the current structure. So, um, Whenever the Wikimedia Foundation makes a decision um, or is about to make a decision that has uh, global consequences, affects the entire movement, then it consults with the communities and with the, with the uh, Global Council as the representative body that um, represents everyone in the movement. And before it makes the WMF makes a decision, it consults with that body and it um, the Global Council makes a recommendation, and then the Wikimedia Foundation hopefully um, accepts that uh, and implements that recommendation. So that's scenario number one. Scenario number two, and scenario number one could be a milestone on the path to scenario number two. So they're not mutually exclusive. They could be on a, on a timeline. So scenario number two is the global council actually turns into a global assembly. And I'm changing the word because to me, in my mind, council means advisory. It doesn't necessarily mean governing. Global assembly um, is a governing body of an international movement. It's like a, and then suddenly you also have probably an international membership organization attached to that. And that is the highest body of the movement. So um, I want to stop here and not necessarily discuss these, but I want to make sure everybody understands these two different. One is an advisory body, one is a governing body. Um, and um, scenario number two 
actually aligns with standard governance practice of international NGOs, who would have thunk. Um, let's move on to the next graphic. So I don't, I'm not gonna spend too much time on these right now, but that's scenario number one. And you can, you can look at this later. Um, we're gonna post this, obviously, the, the presentation on comments, and then you can take a look at it later. Um, but here, here we have the Global Council and the Board of Trustees, and you can see on top here that advisory relationships ship and giving um, decision-making powers to the Global Council um, and getting advice from the Global Council on the good decisions. Next slide. This is scenario number two. You can see the Global Council is now called a General Assembly. And um, it is constituted by, by all the members, which you know the charter will write that down, who are the members and how many come from where and what's, you know, how to become a member and all those things. And the WMF, you can see, is one of the members. Um, that's also how FIFA works. That's also how Wikimedia Germany works. That's also how a lot of other international movements work. Um, so in the, on the left of the Global Council, you, you see a board. So, you know, the Global Council will have probably more than 100 people on it. And so they need a smaller governing body. And then that board might hire a secretariat. It might have staff. So it might become Wikimedia International. So an international organization. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> so we did a little bit of research because we thought maybe we shouldn't reinvent the wheel here. Um, and it turns out uh, most of movement-based international non-governing, non-governmental organizations are governed in this way, like scenario two. So Amnesty, Greenpeace, Doctors Without Borders, Care, Transparency International, a bunch of others are, <laughs> I love this little FIFA discussion right now. <laughs> we should definitely look at them and see how they messed it up. Um, that, anyway, so, but these other movements, which are in a way we could also say similarly structured them as we are, um, are governed in this, in this manner with a general assembly and a secretariat. Um, so let's move on to the next one. Um, what all these governing, governance um, models of these international NGOs have in common is they have a charter or a statute, just like the one we're embarking um, on writing next year. The highest governance body is, like I said, their general assembly that usually meets once a year, makes a bunch of decisions, and then delegates the work. And um, this body elects a board of directors, which in turn appoints and hires a secretariat. So the, those things are pretty standard. What they don't have, obviously, is a pre-existing US nonprofit organization running a global movement. So that's a little kink we throw into, <laughs> into the scenario. Um, but uh, there's obviously still a lot of variables that we have to think about when we write our, our, our charter. Um, next slide. So the two scenarios, again, advisory body and general assembly, if we can comp uh, compare them in terms of how does governance work, next slide. Um, we did like just a little bit of a table here and I, in the interest of time and I see a lot of discussion in the, um, in the chat, I wanna move on from this, but basically, um, we, we have in, in the slides that you can look at later comparing the, the two scenarios in terms of governance. And then the second one that we thought was very important for our movement is comparing them in terms of functions. And when I say functions, I'm talking about jobs basically in the movement. So who's doing what? And that's something, you know, it, it probably we need to talk about as we write this charter, whether it's gonna be in there or not. But who, run, who continues to do the trademark? Who continues to do fundraising? Who is allowed to do fundraising? long-term uh, conflict in our movement. Um, who runs the budget? Who makes grants? Who makes the endowment? And that part is actually the same in all scenarios because that's going to be its own 501c3 
a nonprofit organization, who runs Wikimedia Enterprise, who runs the movement infrastructure, and so forth. So where's the headquarters? <laughs> um, so those are those are functions, um, and a lot of these are um, are subject to negotiation in the next few years. In a scenario two, for sure, and a scenario one, not so much. Scenario one, in our our um, view probably doesn't change all that much about who, who runs functions. So, but I'm gonna, um, I, I, I super welcome comments on that later or during this meeting, but um, I don't wanna get into too much detail because I wanna give us some time to discuss the next slide. Um, oops, that's my screen. So, like I said, there's some standard features that this governance scenario number two has, but there will also be a bunch of things to decide. So, and that's going to be written into the charter. Um, members of the General Assembly need to be defined in the charter. Um, we have to make a choice around how policies are developed and you know what is a policy and what is in the charter. Um, how communities and volunteers participate in global decision making. Um, how the, the operative functions that I just mentioned are distributed among WMF, the other members, um, and, and, the, and an international secretariat once that exists. Um, and in, in the samples that we looked at of other IMGOs, there's lots of different variations, lots of different practices around that. So um, how we allocate resource, uh, uh, resources, how grants are made, um, there's some of the uh, international movements that we looked at that actually have wealth redistribution formulas. So they, I think it was Amnesty, um, they have a formula by which money is dished out every year and redistributed amongst the richer and the poorer um, sections of the movement. Um, and then also we have to make choices in the charter around what is the role of affiliates and hubs and um, so those are some of the topics we see coming up next year when the charter, next few months when we start writing the charter. And all, all those are topics to weigh in on. But so what informs us when we weigh in on these, on these things, not just the practice of amnesty and Greenpeace, um, but I think what we have to continue to consider is alignment with movement strategy because movement strategy is a, not just a set of recommendations, but it's also a set of values and principles. And we need to make sure we stick with those. Um, so those are my next three slides. Um, we'll go through this pretty quickly. Um, again, I, next slide, the, the, the one that I mentioned, subsidiary and self-management. So whatever we create in this charter needs to be um, aligned with, those, with that principle. The next one is inclusivity and participatory decision making. Um, and then the last one is decentralization, which is not written anywhere, I think, in the recommendations or in the principles, but it was definitely a, a strong common desire during the uh, strategy. And so creating a federated governance structure that doesn't all revolve around the US nonprofit organization, I think was, um, was a strong wish. Um, okay, slide. <clears throat> um, so how, what's gonna happen next? Um, I'm a little afraid that this, this committee is going to gather around and then they're gonna start collecting random items that need to be in the charter without deciding where is this journey going to go? So that's why we developed these two scenarios. So we just have some joint language and, uh, and we can talk about where is this supposed to go? Is this gonna be actually an international governing body or is it an advisory council? Because then that makes the chart, you know, it makes the charter pretty different. Um, so rather than collecting items and, and having these sort of, <laughs> having the Wikipedia approach to writing it basically, um, I think, the first thing that the committee should do is review governance scenarios and questions and then decide where is it going to go, um, which scenario are they going to base their work on, and also obviously get some feedback from, from communities around that. And then they can identify what components go in the charter and then maybe what other components are 
more at a policy level that we might want to change in the future so there shouldn't be any charter. Um, so, um, and then they should get the document. So that's kind of our idea and things might go completely different, but um, I'm just worried if we do this the Wikipedia way, it's going to be a huge mess. Um, next slide. So earlier I talked about why do you guys care or why should we all care? And I think the main reason we care is if we're, if we're not at the table, we're on the menu. So this is, this is really going to be, it's, it's an opportunity to do a great reform of how the, our movement is governed um, and we should participate. Um, so you, you guys, everyone here should participate in the deliberations, the common periods, however that process is going to be set up. Um, I would argue that maybe all the meetings of the drafting group should be public and should be televised so that there's, you know, just a complete transparency about what's going on. Um, help create our accountability, help sh make sure that those principles I talked about from the movement strategy, subsidiarity, equity, uh, self-management, um, are actually reflected in the language, both on hubs and on the global body. And then help assure that we focus on creating movement governance rather than continuously trying to reform the, the WMF. I think the WMF is great, at, and this is my personal opinion, I'm not necessarily stating the opinion of Wikimedia Germany at this point, but I think we can spend a lot of energy on um, talking about the WMF, trying to reform it, trying to make it better. And um, maybe we should just focus on creating a, a good movement governance. <laughs> okay, so I'm through. I wanna open it up for questions and um, uh, maybe start, try to start with questions first if something wasn't clear that we said uh, before everybody throws your opinions at us. <laughs> uh, thank you, Nikki, for the presentation. I really like the graphics. They were clear and uh, in a good way uh, visualized uh, the concepts. Uh, I I was following the chat and I think uh, we have a lot to take out from the chat. There are a couple of questions, uh, comments and ideas. Uh, so uh, the very first question was uh, how will uh, the Global Council work with the uh, Board of Trustees? Are the members of the Board of Trustees going to resign or not? I think this was an uh, uh, answer before you explained the mm -hmm. different scenarios about the organizational structure of the Wikimedia movement. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I definitely see, you know, if we go on down the path of scenario two, I see a peaceful coexistence and I see a pragmatic um, distribution of who does what. So, um, you know, I know that people talk about scenario three, which is abolish the Wikimedia Foundation. <laughs> I, I don't, just don't think that's realistic or nor is it desired, nor is it needed. Um, so I see, I see a coexistence between the two. Uh, then we have another question by Anna. So who will back up the charter committee in what they will write and to ensure it will go through even if Board of Trustees does not agree with it? Very good question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> somebody from the foundation here? <laughs> no, there's, nobody, there's no one here from the foundation. I checked. It's <laughs> <laughs> not in the official capacity. Yeah. Um, well, I um, that, that's why I think it's so important that more than just the drafting group, people um, participate in this process to create that type of accountability and cry cry foul if, if something happens. Um, I, I do believe that there's the current movement strategy team has really good faith in just trying to facilitate the process and, um, uh, and the people from the foundation um, that are part of the drafting group are also not you know, the CEO or, or somebody um, at the sea level, but they're people who've worked in the movement for a long time and I assume they have good faith. So that all that is in good faith. Um, but of course, there's always the danger that the Wikimedia Board of Trustees will not ratify this 
and then we have a conflict on our hands. But I mean, that's, I'm hoping that that doesn't happen. And, um, and but at the same time, I feel like it's very important that we, we all back up this process and that we all contribute to it to make it stronger and make it um, legitimize. Uh, we have another question uh, in the chat. Uh, will the Board of Trustees uh, be the ultimate decision maker after uh, founding the Global Council? Well, I, I didn't understand the operative verb in the beginning of the sentence. Can you say that again? Uh, will the Board of Trustees uh, remain the ultimate decision maker? Remain the? The ultimate decision maker. Oh, okay. In, uh, in scenario one, it will. In scenario two, it won't. It will gradually hand over responsibilities to the Global Council. Okay. Uh, I don't think uh, any other questions in the chat. So now we can go with uh, to see if uh, people would like to raise their hands. Um, I did raise my hand, but I'm the host, so I can't actually raise my hand um, officially. Um, just to maybe answer Anna's question as well. Um, I think, you know, when you look at revolutions and how they happen, there's like a certain pressure and inevitability that builds up over time. Like the people in power see that like they are not being accepted anymore. And like there is no way forward where they can stay in power in the same way they had until then. And I think if the foundation funds like a, a multi, like more than $10 million um, strategy process on the end says, no, we, we don't want to do any of this. That looks really weird. <laughs> and, and I'm not sure like they would really do that, to be honest. And, you know, like everyone who's involved in this process, um, I think would be very demotivated by that and maybe do something else instead if that that would actually happen so it's i think it's a scenario that's very unlikely if they don't want to blow everything up which isn't out of the question but yeah okay i'm done uh, we have a raised hand uh, by gergo gergo you can go on please thank you uh hi nikki thanks for keeping us focused on the important questions. So th this is something we've discussed a fair amount when we wrote the recommendations. And, and the example that was brought up a lot is the election of the Wikimedia Foundation Board of Trustees. So the Board of Trustees is uh, elected democratically. Well, half of it is elected democratically by the community. Technically, it isn't. Technically, US law says that the foundation board has to select itself so what happens is that there is a like advisory election and and then the board selects the exact same members appoints the exact same members who have been selected who have been who have won the unofficial advisory advisory mm -hmm. election but mm -hmm. in reality if they selected someone else then that would be a revolution so there is sort of a binding social contract that that they follow the election, even though legally they are absolutely not required. So that that was, at, at least initially, that was seen as a model uh, mm -hmm. for the relationship between the Global Council and the Wikimedia Foundation, that the Global Council would have, uh, would, so there would be a binding social contract that the foundation needs to follow the decisions of the global council, even if legally that's that's not at all easy to establish a similar priority for the council. So I am I, I am somewhat wondering if if uh, we are not over focusing on the less important part, the legal part of how this what this will work versus the versus focusing on, on what the charter should say about the responsibilities and what responsibilities uh, should be taken over by the Global Council from the Foundation in some form and then whether that's implemented with a legal relationship or a social contract relationship that, that just doesn't seem as important. Uh, 
Okay, uh, Nikki, do I have something to comment on this? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't know that I agree. I mean, I, I know that social contracts can work, but there's also, a, as we all know, a good amount of distrust. And I feel like if we have a legal situation or like a, like a legally defined situation between the various entities in the movement, um, that it, there's less room for conflict. And there's also less need, like I said earlier, for trying to reforming the, the Wikimedia Foundation all the time, you know, tweaking this and then adding a little process here. And, um, you know, regional grant committees. I mean, all these things are, are, are um, laudable efforts at becoming more participatory and more open and more, um, more global, really. I mean, also the way they're hiring people all over the world. And, you know, I mean, it's all great. Um, but in the end, it's still a US nonprofit organization with a self perpetuating board. <laughs> and, um, and uh, you know, in the end, the decision making power lies with that US self perpetuating board. And I, I just feel like that is not a sustainable situation, especially not if we take our own legal strategy seriously. So I think the WMF is important. It has important functions that it conti should continue to do. And then gradually we should become like a real international movement. And that also means setting that sort of in stone legally. So that would be my pushback for, for Gergo. Okay, thank you. I see a raised hand by Michal. Michal, you can go with your question or comment. Um, good evening, everyone. Hi, Nicola, Nicole, Eva. Uh, a really nice wrap up. Um, uh, regarding one of the issues, the, one of the first issues that you've mentioned, it was the, let's say, the question of the source of power. I mean, uh, who's recognizing whom, I believe, that there was the, one of the issues, that this is the thing to be discussed. Um, one of the central, uh, central, uh, central sources of, uh, power and weight of the Wikimedia Foundation is that actually this is the entity which actually recognizes who is in and who is out of the Wikimedia movement. Um, this is the, so far, only Wikimedia Foundation executes this power. Uh, so probably one of the very changing things that we can uh, do in the dynamics of the overall movement would be changing that. For instance, if uh, affiliates would be recognizing each other or regions would be recognizing each other or any other structure would recognize the other structure that would be very different from the situation that there is a one entity which is uh, basically deciding who is in and who is out um i'm not advocating here any any situation should we do it or should we not but i think that i believe that this is the big thing on the table basically and it's going to the question like uh, who would be composing and who would be creating this global council and what would be the source of the mandate of the global council. Uh, because if we had a framework where we basically um, recognize each other, then we could form the global council. If we don't have it, then basically it is only the Wikimedia Foundation which can uh, create the global council unless we recognize each other, basically. Um, and I believe that uh, it, at least it partially uh, addresses the question by Anas about the, what what happens if Wikimedia Foundation is not willing to do it or uh, is blocking the thing that this is the one of the potential potential solutions, of course. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Michal. Those are all excellent comments. And I, I realize we haven't thought that much about the affiliate making power that the foundation has. That's definitely an important point. And um, also, sorry to take over <laughs> from you, Carol, but there's a good point from Gergo in the in the chat that says uh, self repeating board, of course, is a much more mission secure type of board than a membership organization. So that's also something that the charter needs to, um, <clears throat> to take into consideration that we, you know, we're not, with the with the global assembly, we're not um, in in at risk for for a hostile takeover. It's a very good point, Gergo. Thanks. 
Uh, okay, we have uh, six more minutes and a raise hand by Ad. Ad, go ahead, please. Uh, Ad, we can't uh, hear you. Can you check with your audio settings, please? It's a very high pitched noise without any recognizable speech for some reason. Yeah. Hmm. Um, maybe while Ad fixes his audio issues. Um, oh, uh, the mic is not working. Yeah. In the chat. Um, maybe can I connect like one, one of the things that uh, Nikki said to, 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 and ask, like, put it to Michael because Nikki suggested, like, that all the meetings should be transparent of the Movement Charter Drafting Committee. Um, do you think that's, like, what is your opinion on that? Let's put it that way. Um, well, what do we mean by transparent? Because the people have a very different, uh, imagination on what transparent means and what it means not i mean uh I just, I just, my, my suggestion was just that they're televised i wouldn't do it i strictly wouldn't do it because of the chilling effect because of what i'm sorry because of chilling effect i wouldn't do it uh otherwise we would have the strange situation where the people feel are uh, limited to express their thoughts freely and then we would have a uh, double meetings i mean we would have a uh, televised televised uh, normal meetings and then we would have some backside meetings with additional knowledge and sub you know the, the additional context provided so i'm not sure that it should be the total chatham chatham house rules or I'm not sure about it, but I believe that there are some things that are very fragile and the people especially who feel that they are representing something or someone or some idea um, or that they can feel some repercussion in the future, uh, I wouldn't want them to be limited in expressing their thoughts and concerns. That's my two cents. Okay, so uh, Ed uh, asked his question in the chat. Uh, how do you define international? There was Does he mean comment. international organization or international NGO? Uh, yeah, there was a preceding comment international about uh, the new international organization. Uh, mm -hmm. We would be recognized by states or in another way. Oh, okay. So I can only speak for like the, the sample of INGOs that we looked at, and um, they're actually very similar to us in that they, like Greenpeace and Amnesty, for example, or also Doctors Without Borders and Transparency, they all have in common with us that they work a lot with volunteers, that they're global, and that they are a network of what we call chapters. It's called different things and different movements. And then they have a headquarters, which is typically actually odd in the Netherlands <laughs> um, or in the UK. Um, and there's, you know, legal reasons they international organizations do not locate in the U.S. because of the U.S. Um, tax, uh, uh, charitable tax code there. Um, and um, so they have a headquarters that's basically, or a secretariat that basically sits typically in a European country, but it could probably also be in, in, in the global south, which I think would be fitting us. Um, but Philip didn't want us to have <laughs> the headquarter discussion. Um, and, um, and so the headquarters basically coordinates, it's like a secretary coordinates all the activities. I don't know if that answers the question, but that's the sample that we looked at. So we didn't look at just random international organizations, but we looked at international movements with a federated structure and a big volunteer part. So it would be comparable to what we're doing. Thank you. And before we end the session, I see that Jan Bart wants to comment or ask something. Jan Bart, please yeah. go ahead. Um, I had a question with regards to if we're going back to Lukas's talk yesterday, one of the problems with a worldwide, like a global council, is, is our inherent um, tendency to not change. 
And how can we make sure that like, um, whatever you can say about a board, it is a focused small group of people who are uh, maybe able to enact change in a more efficient way than a global body, which is like um, a move, an elected movement wide or select the movement wide. How can we ensure something like that to make sure that we don't sort of become even more stagnant than we already are? Since we're running out of time, just a quick answer. The, the, the General Assembly or the Global Council, like I said, is the highest decision-making body. It only meets once a year. Um, so what we had is the Wikimedia Summit or Wikimedia Conference could turn into that. And then in order to be actually able to act and move and make decisions, it has a board again. You know, it has a board, it has a secretary, it has public committees. I mean, just, you know, so not everything is decided. Just the big things get plugged up to the, um, to the membership assembly, and then it operates um, mu very much based on the, you know, on the principle of subsidiarity. So decisions were tried and, you know, have as few decisions as possible bumped up to that, uh, to that body. And there's other um, parts of the international organization that become operative. So I don't know that it doesn't really answer the concern that we have about our, the mental state of our movement. <laughs> um, I think it, it's a better structure than what we have now where we spend a lot of time being an international movement that gets angry about a US nonprofit organization that also tries to do you know, a good job. <clears throat> so. Agreed, thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, thank you, Amber. So we have already run out of time. Uh, I would like to thank you, Nikki, Nicole, and Eva, for your presentation. Uh, I know that uh, 45 minutes is uh, not enough time to uh, discuss all these things and to uh, to realize uh, what uh, should happen and uh, to come up with some new ideas and new concepts that uh, should be taken into consideration in order to improve uh, the things in the Wikimedia movement. I hope that we we are going to have a uh, follow up soon, in which we will have more time to discuss uh, about governance, the strategy in the Wikimedia movement overall. So uh, thank you once again.